The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Good morning, everybody, and happy, happy Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of, of Holy Week, and we start out today with the Palm Sunday. A uh, few announcements. I want to remind everybody to please sign the who's who in the pew. And uh, please, uh, next, next week, uh, provide flush for the fresh flowers for the flowering of the cross on Easter Sunday. Uh, this week is our Holy Week. Our schedule is Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services at 7 p.m. and the Easter Sunday services at 10.30. April 23rd is the uh, Community Choir Festival to be held at St. Gabriel Church on Bardstown Road. It will be held at 6 p.m. and the, uh, there will be a reception following it and the Beulah Choir is going to be participating. So please come out and uh, listen to a nice evening of music. Uh, since the two work days had to be canceled due to the uh, inclement weather, um, we can uh, come anytime during the week ahead, anybody to weed various areas or trim bushes to help make the grounds look uh, uh, nice and neat for the Easter Sunday. Uh, one other item is I wanted, we wanted to bring attention. Lorna Pierce had surgery on March the 28th. She did very well. Uh, she will be uh, going to rehab at the Springs of Stony Brook and she will be in room 107. Uh, so please keep her in your prayers and thoughts. Um, please stand in body or in spirit for the call to worship and prayer. Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Sana. Let us pray. Holy God, you reveal the truth about your people and the ways of our world in the suffering of the Son and his steadfast love. Show us again the image of humility you desire for us and teach us obedience so that self empty may be our pathway. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
let us face this day and of palms and Jesus' passion with honesty. As we enter Holy Week, let us prepare our hearts to follow Jesus to the cross by confessing all that turns us from our Savior's path. Join me in the prayer of confession, please. Abba, God, Father of Jesus, forgive our lack of respect and attention as your Son enters this most painful of weeks. We, like the disciples, fall asleep when Jesus asks us to stay awake and pray. Our minds wander as he sets his path straight for Jerusalem to speak truth to power on our behalf. We are careless with our faith, while Jesus acts with extraordinary love. Forgive our apathy, forgive our inattention, forgive our careless and self-serving attitudes. Remind us this Holy Week of the salvation you offer in Jesus Christ. Let us not take this gracious gift for granted. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please stand and body your spirit to exchange the peace of Christ. Oh! 
Divine Redeemer, center us today in your holy word. Liberate us from the distractions of daily life and the sins which constrict and close our minds. Help us to hear the truth you intend for us today. Amen. Our first lesson is from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. Listen for the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up, up, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our second lesson is from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name, so that at the name given to Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday to you all. Our third lesson is found in the 21st chapter of, of Matthew's Gospel, first 11 verses, um, considered uh, as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The version of the Lord's Prayer that most of us pray uh, each week includes a final uh, phrase that was a late addition. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Kingdom, power, glory. How would you define these words? Years ago, John Philip Newell was preaching at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, Scotland. And standing in the pulpit that hugs one of the massive thousand-year-old pillars of the church, Reverend Newell began his sermon with these words. There will be a time when this building will be no more. There will be a time when our scriptures will be no more. There will be a time when Christianity will be no more. At this point, a woman in the congregation yelled at the top of her lungs, heresy. And this, of course, is when the rest of the congregation woke up and actually started listening to a sermon. Reverend Newell could see them whispering to each other, asking, what did he say? The woman, seated in one of the cathedral's box pews after yelling, stood up, opened the little door at the end of the pew, slammed it shut and stomped down the center aisle in her hard-heeled shoes, shouting one more time before she walked out the door, heresy. Reflecting on this experience, Newell commented, there is a tendency in the West to absolutize our religion. Instead of viewing it as a road sign that points beyond itself, we consider it a stop sign. It becomes the destination, the end. And when that happens, our religion and its practices become confused with the ultimate reality that is always beyond utterance, beyond embodiment, beyond form. When we pray, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, we probably associate our typical connotations with these words. Kingdom is a place to rule over. Power is the capacity to control others. And glory is something like fame. But when we assign our meanings to God's kingdom, power, and glory, we confuse a road sign pointing beyond itself with a stop sign marking the destination. When I was a child, uh, the sixth Sunday of Lent was celebrated as Palm Sunday. And in some days, it was a warm up for the celebration of Easter that came a week later. We would wave our palms, sing hosannas, and acknowledge right along with the original crowd 2,000 years ago, Jesus as king. And why not? By the time Palm Sunday rolls around, most of us have failed to keep our Lenten disciplines and have grown tired of the demands of Lent to turn inward, go deeper, and spend time in our wilderness confronting our demons, temptations, and sins. And if it isn't Lent that's gotten us down, then it's the relentless barrage of depressing news stories. War, natural disasters, climate change, another school shooting, the leaders who can't seem to find any way to work together to effectively serve the people. By the time Palm Sunday rolls around, who isn't ready for a parade? Typically, pastors would select as a focus on this day the palms, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, especially if later in the week that church observes Monday Thursday, if not also Good Friday. And when I arrived in seminary over 30 years ago, there was a movement at that time that recommended combining on this day the palms and the passion. The commemoration of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the events that unfolded after his arrival, events that will lead to his death on a cross. 
Pastoral values result from combining the passion and the palms. Many people simply do not attend worship on Good Friday. The result is that for them, there is a distortion in the story. A story that skips from Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to Jesus' resurrection from the dead evades the question, what happened in between? If we leap from Palm Sunday's hosannas to Easter day's hallelujahs, we overlook the pivotal event of Christ's suffering and death on the cross. The journey to Jerusalem has the cross as its goal. And the cross needs to be kept in sight even during the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. To understand the resurrection, we must contemplate the passion of Jesus. The extent to which we understand the resurrection of Jesus will be determined by our understanding of his passion. Now, I understand the theological rationale behind this decision of combining the passion and the palms, but it's hard to pull off. 60 minutes is not a lot of time to orchestrate a turn from the joy and relief that comes with finally hearing the crowds name Jesus for who he is, Lord and King, to the dismay and disbelief that comes when we realize that Jesus has come to Jerusalem to die. And the crowd naming his true identity is the very thing that's going to get him killed. Jesus entered Jerusalem on the first day of the week, during which the Jews would celebrate Passover, the most holy week of the Jewish year. He entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, an animal considered absurd and ridiculous, especially when compared to the majesty of a horse. And as he entered, Jesus' way was lined with afraid cloaks of his impoverished, ragtag followers who were holding a few branches of straggly palms. And Jesus was greeted not with awe, reverence, and fear, but shouting and dancing and people asking, who is this guy? Most of the people who saw Jesus entering Jerusalem would not have thought he was the epitome of power and glory. Quite the opposite. The great reformer Martin Luther spent a fair amount of time and ink articulating the difference between a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. According to Luther, a theology of glory looks for God in the strong, the beautiful, and the powerful. It's concerned with health, happiness, and prosperity. In other words, with what God can do for us that will give us more power, more control, more success. A theology of glory recognizes that there are difficulties in our lives, but it reframes them to somehow take the evil and hurt we experience and transform them into something that, in the long run at least, is redemptive and ultimately good. A theology of glory understands God based on our own definitions of power and glory. And by contrast, Luther's theology of the cross understands God in light of what the crucifixion reveals about God. This theology looks for God in the places where we most feel God's absence, in pain, humiliation, and suffering, in weakness, foolishness, and death. A theology of the cross is built upon what looks like failure and feels like disaster. While a theology of glory calls evil good and good evil, a theology of the cross calls a thing what it is. A spade is a spade. Death is death, sin is sin, suffering is suffering, evil is evil. There's nothing we can do to make them more palatable. No window dressing that can pretty them up. But this is where we find God. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, 
we are reminding ourselves that God's kingdom and power and glory are astonishingly different from ours, which is why that one word is so important, thine, or in modern language, yours. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not mine, not what I want for myself or what I think is best for the world, not how I want God to be powerful and glorious and king of all, not the accolades and adoring crowds that came to Jesus when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. God's kingdom and power and glory can only be understood when we remember that this is not just a parade. It is a funeral march. This same Jesus we glorify today is going to end up suffering and dying on a cross. The most horrific and evil form of state-sanctioned execution in his day and time. Humiliating, excruciating, demoralizing, disgusting even. Listen for yourself these words recorded in Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to him, whom do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing but rather um, that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hell, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene called Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two rebels were crucified with him, 
one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you would destroy, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The rebels who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, 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 lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling out for Elijah. And once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. The same Jesus we glorify today is going to end up suffering and dying on a cross. A parade today with a crowd waving palm branches wanting to crown Jesus as king. And as the week goes on and the story of the passion unfolds, their shouts of praise turn to demands for his crucifixion. He receives a crown of thorns as he is handed over to be mocked and killed. Humiliating, excruciating, demoralizing, disgusting. God's kingdom and power and glory cannot be understood apart from Jesus' death on a cross, which we do well to remember every time we say, thine, only when we hold together the celebration of Palm Sunday with the despair of the crucifixion can we recognize that like the crowd's choice between releasing Jesus Barabbas or Jesus of Nazareth, we too must make a choice today and every day. Which Jesus will we follow? Which Jesus will we worship? Is it the Jesus whose words and actions we twist to fit our definitions of kingdoms, power, and glory? Or is it the Jesus who re redefines these concepts by revealing the ultimate power and glory of God who enters the confusion and chaos and suffering with us? In the book, Silence by Shusaku Endo. A young Jesuit priest named Sebastian Rodriguez is sent to Japan in 1639 to investigate reports that his mentor, another Jesuit missionary, has renounced his faith. When he arrives, he discovers that the brutal government has driven Christians into hiding. To figure out who are the Christians, the security forces demand that suspected Christians trample on a crudely carved image of Christ. If they refuse, they are slowly tortured to death. Eventually, Rodriguez is captured and forced to watch Japanese Christians, members of his own flock, lay down their lives for the faith. In addition to torturing Rodriguez, the Japanese authorities force him to watch as other Christians are tortured, telling him that if he will simply renounce his faith, their torture will stop. Rodriguez struggles mightily. He understands and accepts the idea that he must be prepared to suffer for his own faith. But he wonders whether it is self-centered and cruel to refuse to renounce his faith when doing so causes others 
to suffer. Finally, as he listens to the moaning of those who are tortured until he tramples the image of Christ, Rodriguez hears Jesus speak to him saying, you may trample, you may trample. It was to be trampled on by men that I was born into this world. It was to share men's pain that I carried my cross. You may trample. Today, we sing Hosanna for a king whose po most powerful and glorious act will be his death on a cross. So as we enter into this holy week, may we remember that all this, this demented glory, this inverted power, this kingdom founded on self-sacrificial love is not yours or mine. God, it is thine. Let us pray. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It is not mine. It is not ours. It is thine. Holy God, you reveal the truth about your people and the ways of our world and the suffering of the Son and his steadfast love. Show us again the image of humility you desire for us and teach us obedience so that self-emptying may be our pathway through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to um, stand in body or in spirit that we may recite the historic confession of the Christian church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father of mine. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Holy God, we shout Hosanna to the Son of David and celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem while also acknowledging the crucifixion that is to come and the real suffering of your people. In this moment of prayer, hear our cries for mercy, peace, and justice. Reassure us with your promises, holy God, remembering God's steadfast love endures forever. Source of life and love, hold those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones, those who feel their world growing smaller with the death of friends, spouses, companions, partners. Accompany these grieving souls in their journey with death, allowing them to experience the peace of your presence and the gentle guidance of your hand. Reassure us with your promises, holy God, remembering God's steadfast love endures forever. Prince of Peace, friend of the oppressed, seeker of the poor and the marginalized, offer hope to those abandoned and ignored. Feed the poor with the hope of your good news. Shelter the houseless and guide us as your architects of grace. May your people live in the safety and security each deserves. Reassure us with your promises, holy God, remembering God's steadfast love endures forever. Savior God, wounded healer, befriend the sick and their caregivers. Look with mercy on those struggling with physical pain and illness. Lighten the load of those whose bodies betray them. Heal the heart sick and apply your balm of love on all your hurting people. Reassure us with your promises, holy God, remembering God's steadfast love endures forever. Mighty prophet, speak truth to those who abuse their power, oppress others for their nations or their personal gain, and betray the dignity of each human life. Write what is wrong among warring nations, holy God, and empower those who thirst for peace. May we wage Christ's nonviolent love in a world dead set on waging violent wars. Reassure us with your promises, holy God, remembering God's steadfast love endures forever. And now as your people gather on this Sabbath day, Hear us pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before I uh, start, uh, read the call for offering, I'd be remiss to remind you next Sunday is our one hour, great hour of sharing. Uh, Please bring these in for, uh, for next Sunday, if you would. God has given us everything, including the life of God's Son. Let us honor God by giving generously of ourselves in return. <laughs> 